have said publicly is we will be at a million dollars a year, I hope, by the year 2018. No one's yet at a million dollars a year, except for Kickstarter. And the reward, well, they're close to a million, but they've just hit the two million dollar total. So I, I like to be accurate about numbers, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration ahead of itself. Um, what I want to do is, is, is tell you two different stories. One is a story of where I come from and ground myself, because you can't understand the success of our crowd without understanding where we're based and what's going on in Israel. And then I want to tell you our story, which is how we go about crowdfunding in a very special, very focused, very different way, that, um, and how that's worked you know, well for us. So Israel, as you know, has is, is, uh, been called the startup nation. The national level of investment in startups is unlike any country in the world. I mean, we're actually ahead of the US in terms of per capita investment. Clearly, Silicon Valley is you know, the leading place in the world, but Israel's number two. And there's just one small difference between our populations between Israel and America. I think mean, they're over 300 million over, about the size of Singapore, a little bigger, about 8 million people now. This year, there will be $5 billion invested in Israeli uh, venture capital startups. That's not funds that's actually deployed into the companies. We have about 1,000 of them that will get VC money. 85% of that money comes from overseas. So this is a market that is genuinely driven by overseas investors who come into Israel. This market has more than doubled in the last two years. In 2013, it was $2.2 million invested. This year, it will be $5 billion. That's a good rate of growth for a healthy and mature industry. What happens also is that our companies go public in New York on an you know, unbelievable rate. This picture is a weird picture. Because when you look at that, you see these four country delegations in terms of their relative size and the ecosystem of Wall Street. You say, what the hell is Israel doing up there? Okay, Canada you can get because Canada is the neighbor, a lot of mining stocks. I understand Austria has been speaking at a lot of mining conferences lately. There are a lot of those companies. Um, and you know, obviously China is China. But Israel, number four, doesn't make sense. But it makes sense when you understand the vibrancy of our tech ecosystem. Now what also happens is a ridiculous amount of M&A activity. Because we've been talking about funding here all day. How do you raise money? How do you raise money? It's not how you raise money, it's how you exit. And maybe I'm too much of a venture capitalist in my bones, but I'm always thinking not about the raise. I'm thinking about check, you know, cashing the check in my bank account as an investor or as a founder. Because it's easy, you know, relatively easy to put money into the funnel. It's really hard to get it out of the funnel. And the two ways you do it is either through an IPO, which by the way, now is not happening now. There was a big article just recently called IP No, okay, because it's just not happening. Private companies are staying private for very much, much longer. If you look at Wall Street this year, IPOs uh, are down by about 60%. While there's a vibrant tech, you know, innovation market, IPOs are down. So the other way to get out, of course, is M&A. Now in Israel, Last year, about $15 billion of M&A activity. This year, will be over $20 billion. So there's still a very positive ratio of exits you know, to uh, investment, about 3 to 4 to 1. And the average exit price is now up to $200 million. So that's been a huge, dramatic lift from 2008. So um, to give you an idea, again, of, of the, the new changes in my country, is we're starting to see billion dollar companies and uh, ways which many of you I mentioned use occasionally to get around with traffic came out of Israel, sold to Google for over a billion dollars, but it's just one of a whole group now of like 12 different, and I'm, I can't, can't update this, they're, they're coming all the time. There was just a recent one um, in the uh, uh, hard area that just got bought, and it, it's just, it's wild because they come across different sectors, whether it's cybersecurity or solar 
or medical devices, and there is, you can't just pin Israel in a certain box. And the biggest of them all, was, of course, was Mobileye. I'm sure most of you haven't ever heard of this company. Mobileye is a, uh, a company which is powering the world of autonomous driving. They make a little chip which teaches cars to see. Um, and this company actually went public last year in the middle of the war we were fighting. It happens in Israel. And the venture capitalists, um, sorry, the venture, the investment bankers told the company to wait. So they said, look, it's not a good idea to take the company public when missiles are falling. You know, usually better for investors when like this piece. And, uh, oops, did I just do that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's sort of a cool effect. Um, but the Israelis said, no, we have to go public. And they said, What's wrong with you guys? Why don't you just be patient? Now, those of you who have dealt with Israelis, you can think of lots of words to call us. Patient is not one of them. Um, we are not a very patient people. And so they went public anyway in the middle of the war. The stock traded up 50%. It's now an $11 billion market cap company. Um, what's driving a lot of this is the phenomenon of serial entrepreneurs. We have in Israel now literally thousands of these people who've had successful exits. Because all this activity is driving people who don't just do this once or twice or three times. They do it for a living. I've got a guy working for me named Eduardo Chaval, who's done seven different startups. Four of them have had outcomes over $500 million. If Eduardo shows up in your office with his new deal, and hopefully he won't since he's working for me, okay? But if he shows up, you write him a check. You don't ask too many questions, but a guy four out of seven times has brought a $500 million outcome and he's looking for an early stage. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. Okay, you go ahead and you, and you invest. Um, if you look at what's also going on is now, because of the growth of the ecosystem, private equity is moving into the market. We never had anything to do with private equity. You're all about venture capital, five, $10 million checks. Now the checks are going to be 50, 100, and more. And uh, what's also happening is you're getting multinationals to move in in what I would only call an invasion. And today, literally, it's not all these guys. I don't have a slide big enough to put up all the logos, but it's basically everybody in the tech ecosystem who's buying Israeli companies. So Cisco has bought 13 companies, Microsoft 10, IBM 10, Google and Facebook each five. And they're all there. Okay, so that creates this ecosystem where you have the startups getting tremendous amount, $5 billion of funding. You have IPOs aplenty, so there's this huge cluster of Israeli companies on Wall Street. You have the M&A activity now with all the multinationals buying the companies, and it's serial, right? The, the, a guy starts the company, gets the venture capital, builds it, sells it to Cisco, starts again, takes it public, starts again, and that's just a self-feeding process, which shows no signs of uh, abatement at this point. The biggest, by the way, uh, multinational investing in Israel alone is Intel. And it's so big in Israel now, it represents 10% of Israel's exports are Intel. Intel has 11,000 employees in Israel, and the joke, you know, uh, is that we want them to label themselves uh, Israel inside, they come back and say, no, no, you know, that big menorah, the symbol of your state, you should have a little sign that says Intel inside, because with all due respect, they're like the company, you know, that drives the country forward. So, what's happening at the moment is we're in a major love affair with Asia. Um, I've never seen anything like it. It used to be that our companies were all focused on Silicon Valley, meaning they would go north from Israel and turn left to America. They go to Silicon Valley, occasionally New York, and now increasingly more and more people are turning right. And the amount of business and investment getting done in China, here in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in India, in Japan, in Korea is, it's inestimable. In, I can't estimate it. Literally the numbers I've heard this year will be a billion dollars of Chinese money invested in the country. And it's changing our relationship very much with this part of the world. That's why I'm here, frankly. 
because we see hundreds and hundreds of investors coming onto our crowd from this region, and we think that this is now going to grow to thousands and tens of thousands. And we think this is a very, very good thing for both sides. Um, this gentleman, if you don't know who he is, Mr. Lika Shane, probably the most savvy, most intelligent investor in this part of the world. He has now 29 investments in Israel. More than half of his startups that he's invested in the world are in Israel. And it's very interesting. He actually invested in the company Waze, where he made $130 million profit on a relatively small investment. He turned around and donated all $130 million to an Israeli university called the Kepnia. He's now become the biggest Jewish philanthropist in the world, but he's not Jewish. Okay, so God bless him. Okay? Um, we love Mr. Lee in, in Israel. So if I look at what's going to happen in the future and make a few couple of predictions and why I'm bring this back to crowdfunding in a second. Israel has already become a world power in the technology area, and that's, by the way, what has powered our crowd. Because when we started, you have to, I was asked by some guys, very bright guys, we're working on the portal here, so how do you start? What do you focus on? What do you, you know, where do you put your, your, your few hours in a day to make something happen? You have to have a unique selling proposition. And for us, it was the fact that people wanted to get into Israeli deals. They wanted uh, exposure. They wanted to tie into this. And if anybody in this audience wants to go make an investment in Israel, how do you do it? Well, today, you say, hey, our crowd, we didn't get that. You missed the whole talk. But the bottom line is before us, you couldn't. You couldn't play. So we rode that very specific, narrow kind of focus into much more of a global focus. But this is going to stay and hands have gone up each time. The last one was San Diego a couple of weeks ago at a conference called Stocktoberfest. I asked the guy, I said, how do you feel? And he said, well, sort of, I'll translate it into a word that makes sense to me, sort of like a schmuck. A schmuck means like an idiot, like somebody who just got taken advantage of. He said, what are you talking about? You were a great crowdfunder. You supported Mr. Lucky. He, he made $2 billion. He goes, yeah, that's the problem. What did I get? A t-shirt? Okay, you know, how come you didn't send me a, you said, I'm the nice gift card. Okay, go out there and raise your money. So the VC model doesn't say, well, we're going to help the poor guys who can't raise money otherwise. They say, no, we're going to bring a broader swath of people into this tech funding area. And we believe that the real work starts the day the check is written. And what a company needs is not just a check, but it needs mentorship, supervision, guidance, assistance in any number of ways. We're going to be like venture capital, but we're going to make it democratic so that everybody can get into it. These are very different approaches. I think you've heard some of the comments I made earlier. You figure out which approach we're about in our crowd. We're clearly in the VC like model. Okay, we are, you know, very happy that there is a junior IPO model. We wish it the best of success, but we're staying at the moment to be like the VC camp. And I think these are very, very different approaches. So when you look at how we stack up, we like to basically combine the two traditional methods of investment today. Either being an angel or being a venture capitalist. Both are wonderful. Both have their limitations. So let's start with being an angel. How many people in this room are angel investors? Raise your hand. Not enough. We need more angels in the next time. Okay? I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the angels in the audience. And the rest of you too. Bottom line is being an angel is wonderful. I've been an angel. I was an angel recently in the Lending Club, which is a you know, great peer to peer finance company that I put you know, money in on the first investors there. And, you know, being an angel means you're in charge of your own destiny. You meet a great entrepreneur, you take the person to lunch, they have passion and sparks in their eyes, you fall in love, it's like a cool date, okay? You know, hopefully you don't take it too far, okay? it's, it's just, a, you know, just a deal after all. And then, you know, you decide how much 
diligence you want to do. You decide how much money you want to invest, 10,000, 25, 50. You pick up the phone, you gotta go do some work, okay? Because if you're smart, you do a little bit of diligence on your own. You gotta call a lawyer, maybe someone's got to do the paperwork. And you probably have to call a few of your friends. Because either your friends brought you, or you're gonna need to bring some friends, because usually your 50K, or your 100K, or even your 250 isn't enough. Right, you gotta put together a little syndicate. Now, that's great, except that you basically are on your own or with your small little group. And that's not your job, right? You're not, you know, there are very few of these angels who are really professional angels, that's all they do. And you gotta find the time to do it and whatnot. Now, we, a venture capital investor is very different. Venture capitalists are professional people who build big funds. And you as an investor can get into it if you find the right fund that's still open with a very big check. You hand the check to the venture capitalist, venture capitalist handles all that other stuff. They go on the dates, right? They fall in love, they get that fund. They choose the companies, they handle the legal, they build the syndicate, and hopefully after 10 years or so, they'll send you a really good check, okay? Which is bigger than what you invested, hopefully, if you did your selection right. Being an angel, you have no fees, right? You, you cover yourself. Joining a venture capital fund, you're going to pay a lot of fees. Are you going to pay 2% usually for 10 years? So you're going to pay 20% fees on your money? You're going to pay upside in terms of 20%, sometimes going as high as 30 or 35%, what's called carry interest. What we came up with was what if you could combine the best of both worlds? What if you could have the freedom, the low entry price, and the low fees of being an angel, together with the professionalism and the sort of coverage, if you will, of the venture capitalism. And that's what we came up with. That's the secret, really, of the sauce of our product. We do the research. We look at thousands of companies a year. We think we select the best. We then put our own money in, and then we invite the crowd to join us. So at our crowd, you can get into the deal for $10,000 minimum, and basically we'll do the rest. We're going to come back to you to ask you to help with crowd building, because we want your involvement. We want you to connect the company to your brother-in-law who's a distributor of a certain kind of product in Hong Kong. We're going to want you to connect the company to your nephew who's graduating at MIT and needs a cool job. We're going to want you to talk to your neighbor who's a correspondent for CNN and get this company some coverage. We're going to ask all that. But basically, we're doing the curation, the selection, the management, and we're getting you into deals where we are not alone. Right? Our whole purpose is to co-invest with all those other guys. So whether it's a deal we've just done literally announced two days ago with Sequoia Capital, or a deal we did a couple months ago with Andreessen Horowitz, or deals we've done with Mark Cuban, or with Jerry Yang, or Marissa Meyer, or Tony Shan, all the rock stars, right, in today's tech investment. Those are the deals we want to get into, not just because they've got rock star co-investors, because we think they're pretty good deals. But we don't do this stuff alone. This is a group sport. And we're more about democratizing the access to venture capital than replacing it with a completely new model of the junior IP. So we sort of position ourselves as the Goldman Sachs of crowdfunding. We're exclusive. You know, not everybody can open an account at Goldman. That's the, 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 you know, the cruel reality of the world. So but they make a lot of money at Goldman, and we'd like to make a lot of money too. And they also provide a great service to great top-of-the-line entrepreneurs. And that's what we'd like to do. But we're going to do it by putting a ton of you people in there. We've got 10,000 investors around the world. We've invested so far over $170 million through our platform. Next year, we hope to do $200 million plus in a single year. Again, it's a very ambitious goal, but we're going to you know, make it as, uh, as close as we can next year. And if you look at how we stack up in terms of both diligence and post-deal management, we're, we're pretty much leaders in both. We spend a lot of time researching these companies. We spend a lot of time 
managing the investments. So Title III, we've mentioned it here a lot over the last uh, several hours, and I just want to give you a couple of comments. I think it's a great thing. It's an important thing. It's a, it's a milestone. It's groundbreaking. It's going to change the world. But, and in particular, by the way, some of the progress they've made, the, the thing is still evolving, right? It's alive. Regulation is never in stone. Regulation changes. And the, the beautiful thing today is that regulators catch a lot of flack, especially from entrepreneurs, where right? you, know, you always hear some stuff. Oh, you, you, you want regulation, but not too much, okay? It's not easy to be a regulator. And in today's world, these regulators have two almost conflicting goals. On the one hand, they know they must open this up for crowdfunding. They're sitting there, and the good ones of them are really trying to open it up. But on the other hand, their job is to prevent that fraud. Okay, and yet one or two or three more of these frauds, our whole industry is killed. Because no one's going to remember who the name of that weirdo was who raised this money for this idiot who stole two million. We're just going to say crowdfunding, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's a fraud. And so the regulators play an absolutely critical role. They've got the almost thankless task, which is how to open it up on the one hand and let us do our business and without too much regulation, but on the other hand, how do I protect the investors? So here, the problem that I've seen so far with Title III in the U.S. is that it does not allow for our kind of crowdfunding not allow for an SPV or special purpose vehicle structure. It's not allowing the there's not the structures to work, okay, which are voting trusts. But the classic <coughs> SPV structure, which is a limited partnership that looks and feels like a venture capital fund, no, not allowed in the current regulations. And therefore, we can't charge our fee structure, which we charge 2% management fee, we don't take placement fees, and we take 20% upside. And the only way we do it is we manage these partnerships that are set up for each and every company. And so we have a, you know, a particular little issue with this. I'm not sure how big it is for the overall industry, but just you know, pay attention to number one. Watch out for those companies that don't have a nominee structure associated with it, where all of a sudden there are 100 or 200 or 500 people on the cap table. Those companies are going to have a really tough time attracting venture capital. And the other big issue is that right now, no non-US issuers are allowed. So I think they're just taking a total step backwards in terms of the globalization of this whole industry, which is why should the US market, the stock market, which allows everybody to go public there, invites them all to come, but crowdfunding, uh -uh. you gotta be an American issuer or we don't have you play in the game. And those are some of the issues that I have with, with Title III at the moment. But in general, I think it's a step forward. So the thing which is driving our whole industry forward, and which you have to keep in the back of your mind or the front of your mind at all times, is this slide. If there's any slide I showed you, this is the most important one. So please try to see what, what's going on up there. The gray is money made in the public market after a company went public. The yellow is the amount of money made when the company was still private. And what you're seeing now is what is driving everybody into this crowdfunding arena, whether they want to or not. And that is as follows. Look back at Apple Computer, Microsoft, Oracle, Amazon. Look at the percentage of gray. A lot of gray. It means if you bought a Microsoft stock when it went public, you could have made 600 times your money. Just, you have to watch Bill Gates, goes on TV, public offering, buy the stock, hold it, to now, 600 times. That's great. Did the same with Oracle, 700 times. Now you go look at the other companies that are up there, Facebook, Yelp, you know, etc. And is there any gray? Where'd the gray go? You can't make money anymore in tech stock. You can make it, maybe if it fails and you buy it on the rebound. But I'll just tell you how you know that's true. Can you buy Uber today on the public market? No, it's still private. Can you buy Airbnb? No, it's still private. 
So all the value is being sucked out of these big tech companies because they become unicorns or decohorn. A <coughs> decohorn means a $10 billion company. So they create this value and they're private. They go public fully valued. And maybe if you're lucky, it'll double or triple. Right? One of the best recent public offerings, Facebook, up there, it's your little touch of gray. Three times your money. Not bad, by the way. You know, make an investment and make three times your money. That sounds good to me. But it ain't the 300 or 500 or 700 times that it used to make. So what this is forcing everybody to ask themselves, how do I get into a private company? And you can be an individual investor. You can be a private equity fund. You can be a hedge fund. But everybody's waking up and saying, how do I put my money in a private money? I don't want to be in the yellow. I don't want to have this tiny little brain. And that is the slide which is pushing this whole industry, which is saying, okay, now we have a solution for how, yes, even the guy who's not connected to the Silicon Valley in club can actually get into that yellow part of the gold part there. So our hot formula, according to Bloomberg, has been passion for Israel. We've used our Israel base to our big advantage, although we're no longer limited to Israel. We're making deals all over the world. 25% of our companies that we're funding are outside of Israel and dreams of the next Facebook. Um, this is our portfolio. It's a bunch of really great companies, 80 so far. They break down into sectors. And one of the beauties of our business model is that because we have this scale, we can now attract big corporate Fortune 500, global Fortune 500 companies who all of a sudden come to Israel because they say, okay, we want to access this innovation. Where do we go shopping? It's like, which mall do we? We're, we're, we're like the innovation mall, okay? We basically say, okay, on the third floor, we've got the food court. The second floor, we've got ad tech. On the first floor, we've got big data. And they have to stop by us because we're the biggest mall in town. There's no venture fund that has 80 companies in their portfolio. And we're only two years into this thing. So this scale has become a weapon for us, allowing us to do all kinds of great business development stuff. And it goes on and on and on. Our companies, it turns out, are not second-rate companies. I think this is, you know, again, if I, I, I showed you one slide, I want you to take away, I want you to take away this statement. If we are simply going to put money into second-rate companies, let's all go home and not come back. Okay, this is not about you know investing democratically in losers. That's not what this industry is about, and it can't be about that. It has to be finding a way in to the very best companies and helping them as a crowd get even better. And if you're not making investments in the top companies, then you're not doing crowdfunding right. So we're very proud that our companies are already getting recognition alongside the other venture-backed companies as the tops in the world. Two of the 49 by the WEF in terms of groundbreaking primary. You know, three of the 12 impossible ideas Israel turned into reality. Two of the best fintech innovators, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, and we're you know, very proud of these, these awards for our companies. We also have a lot of impact investments. It turns out that what works on the crowdfunding platforms is passion. If it's boring, forget about it. You might make a great business, but you'll never raise the money. So what people respond to often is something which is impactful. So we have a company which we first took public called Rewalk. It's on the bottom there. Rewalk is a company that allows a paraplegic to get up out of their wheelchair and walk again. It's really that moving. I mean, you literally see somebody who's been never walking in their lives, they strap this thing on and they walk again. That's passion, that's social impact, that's inclusion, and it's also big bucks. That company went public last year on NASDAQ, and we had hundreds of investors who made money on that by getting into that investment through a crowdfunding platform. We've had three exits. You have to focus on access to make sure that your, your investors are getting a return. 
if you look at a company like Sync, um, this is a company that might be a little controversial here or elsewhere, but it's leading the way in medical cannabis. They're finding a way to deliver medical cannabis in medical format. The problem with every discussion of medical cannabis is a little bit of a joke. Right? It's like those medical uh, pot shops on the Venice boardwalk, you know, you, you see a doctor and he says, what's wrong with you? Oh, my knee hurts. Okay, smoke a couple joints. Okay, that's not medicine, guys. You know, and even if you have a grandmother who's suffering from cancer and she wants access to it, how in the heck does a doctor get off by saying, Granny, take a couple of joints and call me in the morning? That's not medicine. Okay, so what this does is it actually measures completely accurately down to the microgram level how much cannabis you inhale and what the dosage is and whatnot. It's a very, very serious scientific business. Now, the beauty of crowdfunding is you didn't give me a fund and I didn't make the decision for you. I'm sure there are people in the audience who said, what is the mess around with that stuff? That's crazy, I don't like that. Fine, don't invest. We have another one called Clipfork. I don't know if it's on this slide or... But Clipfork uh, is down there in the lower left. This is a company that does a biometric scan for guns. Meaning that today, anybody can become a gun and fire and hurt themselves, kill others. And the horrible thing in America, there are 300 million legal guns. You don't know how many illegal guns. Three million legal guns in America today. And a kid can go to you know, parents' headstand where they put the hand down to protect themselves and pull it out and start hurting people badly. And it happens every single day. Now this company says, okay, we're going to put a scanner on the bottom of the, the ammunition cartridge, so if that's not you, you can't use it. This is going to save, in my opinion, tens of thousands of lives. It's a great company. But again, some people saw this on our platform and went, what? Guns? Are you crazy? You're investing in guns? I don't want anything to do with guns. Well, that's your business. Okay, we have people who love this deal. We think it's in totally impactful, it's going to save lives. But that's the beauty of crowdfunding. Someone's anathema is the other person's passion. Okay, that's why crowdfunding works. But if you got to put something up there which is passionate. Um, we are focusing now on water with a wonderful company called CropX, which is uh, basically using smartphone platforms to improve irrigation throughput, and uh, it's, it's a great company, it's a joint venture out of New Zealand and Israel. There are wonderful solar companies coming out of Israel at the moment. Mobileye, we talked about before. Uh, we have a great company called Metaware, which is using big data to prevent prescription error. It turns out that one of our entrepreneurs uh, is a deputy head of internal medicine in one of Israel's largest medical centers. And one of his friends came to him in tears and said, I just killed the kid. He was one of the We all lose patients. What happened? He goes, no, I killed the kid. He said, what, you, what happened? He goes, well, I had a patient. He was an asthma patient. He came in to get treatment. It was a straight, you know, forward, very simple treatment. I took my new shirt, my new iPad medical record system. I pulled down the drop-down menu. I pushed the asthmatic drug and sent him home. And six days later, his mom said, you know, so-and-so died. How? Well, it turns out I pushed the wrong bar, and I pushed an anticoagulant, which literally killed the kid after six days. And it turns out in today's medical record world, there's no software that will prevent that from happening. All this medical prescription software is drug interaction. Nothing was stopping this kid from basically taking a drug or something. So this doctor set off to build a company to solve this problem. General Electric is now invested with us and is being employed at our medical center and it's going to hopefully save a bunch of lives. And then we have a company called Site Diagnostics, which is making an absolute breakthrough system for malaria testing. It will turn a malaria test, which usually has one of two choices. Either it's very fast and very bad and inaccurate, 
or it's very, very accurate or it has to be done in the hospital. And this gives you hospital accuracy in the field, in the jungles of Thailand or in the deserts you know, of Arabia or in you know, dark Africa. It will give you the best kinds of uh, malaria testing you've ever seen. Then we have a company called Surgical Theater, which is a bunch of Israeli flight simulation guys who have taught brain surgeons how to simulate brain surgery the way the fighter pilot will simulate his mission. And uh, we're going to stop with that kind of thing. I do want, you know, and you some forward to us on our crowd and the other side. One last question. From your experience, what would you, what would be your return life for this time spent? What's the return life? The time spent. Yeah, there's some regulators in the room. Want me to talk about that? <laughs> I mean, look, this. Um, all I can tell you is we're working really, really hard. Okay, we are doing good work in terms of deal selection and curation. We're working hard to help the companies. To tell you what kind of return I have to be a you know, fortune teller. But I, what, I, what I can tell you for sure is that vintage matters. Right? How many people like wine in this audience? Come on. Aren't Asians drinking wine? Come on, we like wine, right? Okay. What do you know about wine? What's the most important thing? It's important that the brand, right, where the grapes come from, who the winemaker was. But what's really important is the vintage, okay? It's like, what year was it? Because you can have the greatest winemaker and the greatest brand, and it's one bad year when the Indonesians were burning all their forests and whatnot, and things didn't work, okay? And that's not gonna be tasty wine. It's gonna taste like smoke. Okay? There's nothing you can do about it. So the bottom line is that, is that you need to worry about vintage. And I don't know, is this year gonna be a good vintage? <laughs> Back in the year 2000, it seemed like it was the best vintage ever. Boy, I could smell that wine. And be, people like myself were investing and investing, and it turns out it was the worst vintage of all time. If you were unlucky enough to be investing in 2000, I don't care who you were, you lost your money. Okay, because that's just the way that these things work. So I don't know if we're in a good vintage year or not. Usually it takes a couple of years to see how the, how the deals are doing. But I think that we, you know, right now we're doing well, thank God. And I think we'll continue, you know, to, uh, to do that, but I, I can't give a prediction of return. I can tell you is that in this asset class, if you don't aim for double-digit returns, if you think that you're going to get 3 or 4%, then forget about it. You'll give your money to the bank, okay? You know, if you can get that uh, <laughs> return from a bank. But, you know, this is a lot of risk. In our language, uh, where I come from, the phrase is home sikun, which means danger capital. This is not venture capital, because Americans, it's nice, sounds like Disneyland, like an adventure, okay? You know, in my language, it's like right in your face, boom, it's danger capital, okay? And this is high risk, potentially high reward, and you have to do it the right way, or don't do it at all. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank you very, very much, and I look forward to being back. Thank you.